Now we will turn to our second speaker, who is Dr. Nazila Iskandarova. Dr. Nazila Iskandarova is an assistant professor in Islamic spiritual care and program coordinator for the Master of Pastoral Studies program at Emmanuel College of Victoria University in the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Iskandarova is a registered psychotherapist and registered social worker in Ontario, Canada. She is the recipient of several prestigious awards. Her primary area of research is psychotherapy, spiritual care, and mental health. The title of the paper Dr. Iskandarova is going, going to present is Praying and Celebrating in Times of Zdrar, which means immediate necessity, a Muslim response to COVID-19. We are all ears, Dr. Iskandarova. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I uh, feel great uh, gratitude to uh, Huron University and also Grad uh, Student Association and Dr. Ingrid Madsen, for sure, uh, to invite me to talk about the Ibada and the uh, Ibada in times of uh, uh, COVID-19. So I'm going to share my screen with you and uh, Okay, so title of my presentation is Praying and Celebrating in Times of Immediate Necessity and Our Muslim Response to COVID-19. Uh, I'm going to talk about the religious and spiritual ceremonies we celebrated in the past uh, amid uh, COVID-19. And uh, before I start, I have to tell you that like everyone, definitely like millions of, of people around the world, Muslim also felt the heavy burden of the COVID-19, both as individual or as individual. Uh, and also as community. And uh, these challenges and difficulties uh, included fear, anxiety, panic. Uh, many Muslims, like other non-Muslims, also had financial, economic, social, and political concerns. And we still have uncertainty regarding how to attend religious ceremonies that we uh, used to publicly celebrate them before uh, COVID-19. Uh, for example, this year we had two major Muslim holidays, uh, Eid al-Fitr and also Eid al-Adha. And also Muharram, uh, a sacred month for Muslims, fell in the COVID-19 as well. Uh, in the beginning of uh, Muharram, uh, I was approached by one uh, community member and she was curious how to practice Muharram service to celebrate the life and legacy of Imam Hussein ibn Ali. We know that for Muslims, Muharram is a sacred month and because the Quran declares Muharram as sacred. And as the first month of Islamic lunar calendar, Muharram is also the month when the Prophet announced Hijra or migration of his followers from the place of persecution, which was Mecca, to the place of liberation, uh, which was Medina. I would like to quote from Al Farouk Haki. Uh, he is a refugee lawyer in the Greater Toronto area in Canada. And in his Facebook post, uh, Al Farouk Haki calls uh, Muharram uh, a journey for human dignity, uh, an event uh, that changed and transformed human history forever, referring to the importance of uh, uh, migration of early Muslims. Uh, the Shia Muslims in Canada and also all around the world, we know that celebrate uh, the month of Muharram to mourn and also remember lives and sacrifices of Hazrat Hussein and the Ahli Bayt, the household of the Prophet Muhammad, and their sacrifices at Karbala. We remember the commitment uh, to preserving the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, the practice of religion 
for God alone and standing against the oppression and tyranny of Moavia I, who died in 680 and who was a founder and first caliph of the Umayyad Caliphate. However, due to the COVID-19 challenges, many community members could not go to the mosque and attend Muharram services. And uh, for sure, they deeply, deeply felt the impact of the COVID-19 that profoundly changed our response to celebrating important days uh, and practicing religious ceremonies. <laughs> for example, in uh, some countries like in Iran, and in Azerbaijan, where Muharram services are publicly celebrated and demonstrated, people, uh, some of the people got confusing messages. Uh, the Azerbaijani government prohibited public gatherings, including uh, congregational prayers and uh, annual uh, religious congregations and other <coughs> social and <coughs> spiritual gatherings. And uh, many people actually supported the government decision by declaring such gatherings uh, pose safety and health risks to uh, participants. However, in Iran um, and in other countries, some religious groups uh, still believe that despite the ban, the community should uh, gather together, should come together and mourn the martyrdom of the Ahl Bayt because of the spiritual significance of such remembrance. Uh, in addition to various government regulations around the globe, uh, we, uh, during this uh, six months period and more than six months period, we have witnessed a lack of social connection and isolation. And I have seen the impact of this uh, isolation and the adverse effects on mood, uh, cognition and fun function and quality of life among Muslims. Uh, we have to acknowledge that the COVID-19 um, can be a blessing for some, um, but at the same time, we have to admit that it is still uh, anxiety-provoking illness and it emotionally uh, affects many Muslims. And uh, many Muslims uh, that I have seen and I have talked, they have been traumatized by COVID-19 and its uh, adverse effects. And people cannot and uh, could not and cannot visit the sacred places. They cannot visit each other, especially those who are sick and they are in long-term care homes. And these situations triggered a follow-on question regarding um, regarding how we celebrate uh, important uh, Muslim uh, holidays. Uh, I have questions here and the, that I ponder and I always ask myself that do religious and spiritual gatherings really bring relief and healing uh, in the midst of COVID-19? And uh, do participants of these religious and spiritual gatherings worry about getting ill or spreading the virus in these gatherings? Uh, do the regular participants feel guilty or relieved when they take caution by not participating by considering that they might contribute to public health by not spreading the COVID-19 and uh, also saving the lives uh, of themselves and other, other people? Uh, when I ponder on these questions, I'm not necessarily interested in answering what Islamic practices should look like during COVID-19 and how we should perform them. However, I am mostly interested in the functionality and processes of maintaining our spirituality and religious practices that we used to perform uh, before COVID-19 and how we used to perform these um, practices during the times like this while respecting the safety of ours, our families, friends, and others. I still reflect and think that in the midst of uh, COVID-19 and in, the, in a context of COVID-19, what purposes the religious and spri spiritual rituals serve, how they are perceived, by whom, and how we Muslims make sense of spiritual practices during these times.
Definitely in this short presentation and also during this conference, we don't have enough time to respond to all issues that we face, but at least it gives us chance to reflect on the significance of modifications regarding spiritual and religious practices during um, the COVID-19. The majority of Muslims uh, understand the challenges of COVID-19 definitely from the perspective of our Islamic tradition. And uh, we use Islamic theological foundation and uh, also other sources of Islamic tradition, how we respond to the COVID-19. Some people I have told, uh, they see COVID-19 as a test of humanity simply because of the silence and lack of action before the suffering of innocent people and also abuse of nature. Some also wonder how Islam helps us to deal with demands such as staying healthy and protecting others by respecting social distancing and isolation requirements. Such an outlook definitely has an outer external dimension as well as an inner and spiritual dimension. And it involves questions such uh, regarding human rights, public safety, existential concern and suffering. From the framework of Islamic, Islamic outer dimensions, the fundamental rights in the Islamic tradition, particularly Sharia are five. Uh, these are generally presented as maqasid al-sharia or daruriyat al-khams. Maqasid uh, is, or the main purpose of the sharia is maslaha. And maslaha means the fulfillment of some good. And mafsada, the avoidance of some mischief. In Islamic law, the term maqasid uh, refers to a purpose, objective, principle, and goal. Uh, and these are five. The first one is the protection of a deen, the religion or spirituality, the protection of life, the protection of dignity, um, the, the protection of lineage, the protection of intellect and protection of property. In addition to these uh, values, the Maliki Jewish Shihab al-Din al-Qarafi added the protection and preservation of honor al it as a sixth objective in uh, Maqasid of Sharia. The concepts of Sharia, particularly taklif and ahliya and its conditions such as aql, ilm, hurriyat in both the classical and modern figure works, I think that are helpful in the context of both ibadat and mu'amilat during the time of COVID-19. In his Islamic uh, Biomedical Ethics, Principle and Application, Professor Abdulaziz Sachadina states that two essential areas of human life define the scope of uh, Sharia. The acts of worship, both public and private, connected with the pillars of faith and acts of public orders that ensure individual and collective justice. According to Professor Sachadina, the first category of actions undertaken to seek God's pleasure is collectively known as ritual duties toward God. Briefly, we call it ibadat or acts of worship. And these include all religious acts such as daily prayers, fasting, almsgiving, and so on. The second category of actions undertaken to maintain social order and we call it social transactions or mu'amalat, or literally social intercourse. As an outer layer of Islamic tradition, the maqasid al-sharia is helpful to understand the COVID-19 restriction and the impact on religious gathering, both as ibadat, acts of worship, and mu'amalat, social transactions. I personally think that these principles and concepts outline the general framework for us today, including religious leaders, healthcare providers, and families to address important questions such as, what constitutes a moral demand in Islamic tradition in respect to the COVID-19? What types of religious ceremonies, including funerals, are allowed in the Islamic tradition in the socio-historical context and responses to similar situations in the prophetic tradition? Uh, 
How do contemporary Muslim responses to the challenges mentioned above in Europe and North America unfold in the fear of nihilism and the mystery of life and death in response to COVID-19? And uh, finally, are the concepts of maqasat al-sharia are sufficient to comfort and empower the sick and heal, sustain, guide, reconcile the affected in response to the COVID-19? I think that in addition to the outer dimension of Islamic response to the COVID-19, we have to look at Islamic spirituality or inner or spiritual dimension of uh, our response to COVID-19, especially all the individual and collective sufferings during these difficult times, make all of us to turn to Islamic spirituality, first of all, to explore the ex existential questions from the perspective of a theology of suffering. In Islam, such questions have always been examined in relation to God's power, human freedom, human will, divine omnipotence, divine justice, and divine destiny, such as ajal, the appointed time of death, and sustenance. We know that theodicy as a branch of theology is concerned with the formal and ontological problem of evil. And theology helps us to answer to the question of God's concern or sol solicitude for creation. The majority of theological schools in Islam agree that they all agree with the concept of Al-Qadar, the divine decree, and Al-Qadar, divine uh, foreordination, and suggest that the existence of evil and suffering has some hikmat or wisdom or function. In addition, there is a strong emphasis on human responsibility and obligation in our response to evil and suffering. So, the Quran highlights the dilemma of the existence of evil and suffering in the context of finding a spiritual lesson in every suffering by informing a believer that uh, he or she might be tested in our journey of discovering the true essence of the self. And the Quran states that the one who created the death and the one who created the life will surely test us and uh, which of us is best indeed, and uh, God is exalted in might, and God is forgiving. Uh, such coronic response definitely encourages us uh, to be mindful of our behaviors, our beliefs, and our attitudes in respect to our responsibility to self and to society, uh, especially in regard to how we maintain and enhance the well-being of others. And having such a perspective in mind, many Muslims are exploring the strengths and resilience within the Islamic tradition. However, uh, in the other presentation we have seen, one of the things uh, we are observing um, in the Muslim community is the uh, ad advocacy action. Uh, how we are visiting the sick, how we are feeding uh, those who need assistance. The Prophet wasallam said, he is not one of us who does not have mercy upon our young, respect our elders, and command good and forbid evil. So this kind of tradition in Islamic uh, um, sources encourage us to be advocate for people uh, who are vulnerable uh, during COVID-19. Uh, I, I'm going to give you some examples of how Muslim organization advocated on behalf of fellow Muslims and other communities, not only Muslim communities, but also other non-Muslim communities as well. Uh, for example, we heard the news about measures suggested in Italy and the United States uh, in the beginning of COVID-19 to prioritize treatment for healthy individuals while leaving out some, especially elders, patients with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, and autism. And uh, that shocked many people, many mindful people, and uh, those people who are advocates for social justice and action in our community. And uh, 
they uh, they challenge such measures by advocating the sanctity of, of life if regardless of our ability or disability Similarly, in response to a distressing news that those who died of the COVID-19 might be cremated against the will of uh, their families in the United Kingdom, both Muslim and Jewish group called the United Kingdom government to uphold Article 9 of both the European Convention on Human Rights and Human Rights Act of 1998. And this act actually protects the right uh, to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. And the European Convention on Human Rights and the Human Rights Act in 1998 was used as one of the main framework for uh, both Muslim and also Jewish communities that believe in the sanctity of the dead body and religious burial. Such advocacy also brought some relief for Muslim, Jewish, and other organizations who are worried that uh, who are worried about being cremated uh, despite their wishes. So in Canada, the Canadian Muslim uh, Muslims established COVID-19 task force, and the, they uh, did bring together many medical, religious, and community organizations, such as Muslim Medical Association of Canada, uh, Nasiha Mental Health, and Nisa Helpline, Federation of Muslim Women, ISNA Canada, Muslim Council of Peel, Sakina Homes, National Zakat Foundation, Canadian Council of Imams, Deaf Muslims of Canada, and other organizations. In order we share uh, our knowledge, experiences, and resources to develop interventions to address identified needs during the pandemic. So in that regard, I think that uh, we did an excellent job to respond to COVID-19 and protect uh, our community uh, from COVID-19 and its consequences. Um, now I would like to share with you, if I have time, uh, this important resource, uh, Azerbaijan Women Support Center. Okay, I want to share with you the survey done by Azerbaijan Women Support Center in Canada. Uh, they did a survey on perspective on back to school during COVID-19. Uh, majority of most um, Azerbaijani community members they believe in Islam and the. Uh, the, they are culturally Muslim, but the, I would say that they are good Muslim, they are mindful of the uh, social responsibility. So they did a, a survey among the community members in Canada, and the first question they asked from the participants, will your child children go back to class in the fall, so in September? And majority said that they will do. So uh, we uh, did this survey uh, right in, uh, in August, and Azerbaijan Women Support Center, they, um, they conducted this survey in regard how our community members, especially mothers, uh, feel prepared to send these children to school, and uh, because they had uh, lots of fear and anxiety and concern, so they just reflected all this anxiety parents felt uh, regarding back to school during COVID-19. And uh, they, uh, 50 pe 52 people actually responded to the survey and the majority of, uh, of respondents, they were 18 years old and older and all of them uh, reside, reside in Ontario. Very interesting is that majority of respondents considered that they uh, feel prepared to send the school back to school in the fall. Um, when we ask the question uh, that if this if they think that school has adequate safety measures to ensure a safe environment for their children, again, 69% um, of respondents said that yes, they feel that Ontario schools are safe enough for their children if they go back to school. And uh, one of the questions uh, uh, was that, are you familiar with safety indicators and protocols of your school boards in case of a 19 COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, however, only 52 people out of uh, um, 52 people said that yes, they are somewhat familiar, and 21% said that they are somewhat familiar with uh, school protocols regarding uh, COVID-19. Um, some 65% uh, of respondents said that uh, they will spend extra money 
to purchase personal protective equipment for their kids. So it's kind of additional financial burden on some uh, families. They don't have enough uh, to pay rent and to buy food, for example. So definitely COVID-19 did bring extra expenses to the families. Um, when we asked uh, some respondents that if they prefer a full-time school, online only learning, or a combination of the two options, 54% uh, said that they prefer for online only learning and some said that full-time school uh, one of the important questions of the survey was that are you nervous about sending your kids to school this fall and 57 percent said yes and 42 percent said no and when we asked people uh, those people who responded that why they don't feel uh, concerned about sending their kids to school they said that because they are sure that canadian government there and also ontario school do a good job in terms of protecting our children and uh, to prevent covid 19 in schools and uh, some schools we, we know that in canada some parents they are qualified to use school busing to send their kids to school and one of the questions reflected that dimension of uh, using the school bus and we asked them that if uh, parents still be using that service this fall, and 55% said that yes, they will use that service. And uh, one of the questions was that, do you think that your kid will wear a face mask and keep two meter physical distancing when they are in school? And the uh, very interesting answer to that said, 69% of parents said that, they don't think that the kids will wear a face mask and they will keep to a metaphysical distancing when they are in school. Only 30% of respondents, they had some kind of confidence that they, their children might wear a face mask and keep uh, two meter um, uh, distancing. Uh, what is important in, the, in this survey is that the result of the survey uh, among yes, it is a, among a small number of participants among the members of the Azerbaijani community in in Canada, but it underscores the nervousness and concern uh, around uh, the back to uh, to school in uh, in September. And many Azerbaijani mothers they, in Canada, they feel that they don't have an option except to send their children, uh, children to school, uh, despite the concerns that uh, they might uh, pose um, some safety risk to their kids. Uh, by doing this survey, uh, those who did this survey, they hope that uh, the concern of the parents regarding the health and safety of our children and also as a community members and also to, uh, teachers definitely and those who work in the school, uh, the Canadian government will take these kind of concerns into consideration when uh, can Canadian government applies certain protections to uh, to prevent COVID-19 among the children during the flu season. And it is still uh, very important uh, for us uh, to keep our children to safe to, uh, in the school environment. However, uh, I think that um, uh, I want to see more service like this in the Muslim community in Canada to see where we are at now, uh, to, to how we are confident in regard to sending our uh, kids to school and keeping them in the school. So I just wanted to share the result of this survey with you. And because I, I believe that it was really very good survey and responses just give us enough, um, enough to reflect on the concerns that we parents have.